Wij zijn daar Zijn daar Goed. Dan je bent van die Oké. Maar we wachten nog even op jou, want jij gaat daar nog iets live zijn. Ja? Ja? Oké. Dan gaan we, we kunnen beginnen roepen. Nee, tot, uh, als ik klaar ben met de ja, intro. Welkom uh, in de Van Abbe Museum. Uh, I'm Steve Tentei, I'm curator collections in the Van Abbe Museum. And welcome to this artist talk with Melvin Moti, uh, part of the work of art series from the Smart Spaces uh, project, uh, a European program running across several countries, focusing on the development of new digital tools in museums. And we're very happy to uh, also uh, welcome any viewers we might have in uh, households all over Europe and the world. Um, we're very happy that uh, we are here tonight together to talk about um, a film that uh, Melvin made several years ago in 2016 called Cosmism. Uh, a very special film uh, reflecting a very important and uh, significant event in recent history and uh, in a very unique way, but we will talk about that uh, uh, during our evening. Um, and a film that's also at the moment not only on <coughs> view in Eindhoven, but also in view in Istanbul, as it is part of the Istanbul Biennial, which is currently running there. Um, yeah, I think Melvin himself does, doesn't need much more of an introduction than to say that uh, he's an artist based in Rotterdam, working all over the world, working on many different projects at the same time. If I'm trying to contact you, you're always somewhere else. Um, and um, I'm sure that um, uh, there will be a lot upcoming soon on that front. But tonight we focus on Cosmism and this film, and I'm very happy to start this evening with uh, giving uh, the floor to Melvin, who will uh, pr present the text and then afterwards we will have a discussion, which is also a discussion with the people here in the audience and also with you at home. Um, so, please Melvin, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming and <coughs> um, the virtual audience for um, tuning in. Um, I will give a short talk about uh, the film Cosmism, specifically. Um, I chose not to uh, show any images uh, of the film or of uh, my research um, in general. Um, and um, that is mainly because of the question and the problem of representation. Um, and I think um, the decision not to show any images um, here for this talk also um, forced me to think about the question of representation and so my short talk which will take a bit more than 30 minutes will be mostly about images and images as um, representation um, especially with the representation of violence um, 
um, for those who are here in the audience, um, but for those who are sort of virtually uh, present, uh, you did not hear the song that was playing here um, uh, before uh, Stephen gave his introduction. Um, you all did, and it is a song by uh, Kate Bush called Cloud Busting, um, song from the 80s. And um, apart from being a huge Kate Bush fan, which would already be a reason to play the song um, at any given time, um, I also uh, thinking thinking back about the, the moment that I was doing my research um, and uh, thinking back about our, uh, about this specific song. It has a very strange relevance uh, to um, the issues that we are all confronted uh, with uh, right now. Um, climate change, uh, the climate crisis. Um, the song Cloud Busting is um, about uh, William Reich, uh, who is in the video clip played by Donald Sutherland, um, and um, Kate Bush, who has short hair, looks a little bit like Winona Ryder in the moment that Winona Ryder was very popular. Um, and she's playing the son of William Reich. Um, and um, William Reich was an engineer who was um, uh, commissioned by two farmers uh, to produce rain after a long summer of, uh, a long dry summer. Um, two farmers commissioned William Reich to make a machine to basically <coughs> manipulate clouds and, and, and make rain. The, the song is about that and uh, uh, the man really existed and this really happened. It's a very strange thing that this song out of every song from the 80s is somehow so relevant to what is happening now or what we, what we are confronted right now with right now. Um, the film Cosmism um, for me is um, apart from, uh, let's say, the topical part of the research, uh, which is the background of the film Cosmism, the film is, for me, um, it provides a framework to come to grips or to get my head around to major topics, I think, that sort of dominates uh, the world that we are living, that we are, it would, uh, living in right now, which is um, the climate crisis and geopolitical conflicts, um, and especially geopolitical conflicts after 9-11, which seems to sort of extend and extend and extend and find um, sort of a new chapter in a, in a, a new area, in a new um, part of the world, but somehow still connected to that sort of major um, event um, which is 9-11. So I will talk about cosmism and the, the research that I did, but uh, also specifically talk about some of the ideas that I was struggling with while making the work. Um, so everything which I, that I'm saying um, is not a conclusion. It's really just things that were in my mind when, while I was um, questions basically that I was trying to solve while I was making making this work. Um, the Cosmists uh, were a group of Russian scientists who lived from the end of the 19th century uh, until the 1950s. Um, they were never really sort of a co coherent group uh, or coherent collective. They were individuals and they were loosely sorry, called uh, the Cosmists. Um, and sometimes they also lived generations apart. Sometimes they also never knew each other. Um, um, there were scientists, Russian scientists, who on one hand had a very um, sort of part which was hard science. They were involved in, in the space age. There were rocket scientists, there were engineers. But in the background, they all had more theoretical, uh, personal research or personal sort of academic, um, let's say, um, work which was more speculative and often also more esoteric 
um, they were all somehow affiliate, affiliated or related to a Russian philosopher Nikolai Fedorov, who lived in a, at the end of the 19th century. Um, and um, in the 1870s, uh, he wrote about the necessity of um, cutting down on fossil fuel and to, and to rely more on solar energy um, in order to sort of maintain uh, a healthy planet. And this was already sort of written in the 1870s, um, which obviously is uh, a very relevant thought, but also has been foreseen for, for such a long time. Um, he also had a lot of other ideas. I mean, I will not speak about sort of historical research because many of the things about uh, Fedorov can be read on Wikipedia. So if you want to know more about his ideas, you can read. Uh, I, don't, I will not spend this precious moment on that. Um, but he had other wild ideas and other ideas which were completely sort of unrealistic. Um, he was, for the most for a part of his life, until he was 40, he was a, he was a teacher. Um, and then afterwards he became a librarian in Moscow for the Lenin uh, library. Um, and as a librarian he was known to give uh, customers extra books. So people would come there and, and, and borrow books. He would give them books that he thought were relevant to their research but was not on the list. So in this way he became some, somewhat of an advisor or a mentor for, for people who uh, for customers of the, of the library. And he also uh, sort of took under his wing a, a number of young uh, sort of uh, students uh, in their teens. Um, and one of uh, them was um, um, who, a boy who would later become uh, an influential uh, sort of scientist, scientist in the Soviet uh, space age, uh, Konstantin Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky. So uh, my Russian names will sound like this. <laughs> Konstantin Tchaikovsky. Um, he, at an early age, uh, um, sort of uh, got in touch with, uh, uh, with Fedorov in the Lenin Library and he was one of the people who sort of was mentored by, by Fedorov. And apart from slipping books about math and physics, which were mostly what these young students were, were researching, uh, he would also slip in books which were more occult or more esoteric. Um, so some of his ideas spread in that sense. And, um, uh, Tchaikovsky moved from Moscow to Kaluga and in Kaluga Tchaikovsky became himself a teacher and he himself then became a, um, a teacher of a student called Alexander Chichevsky. Um, and Chichevsky was a um, um, sort of young, bright student. Uh, Kaluga is about 200 kilometers south of, of Moscow, so quite a rural, uh, already the start of rural. Uh, Russia and a small, a small city. Um, and Chichevsky was um, uh, later in life he would uh, sort of <clears throat> became very much involved in uh, trying to study the relationship between um, activities on the sun and, and social uh, events on earth. Um, he wrote as he graduated from university a paper uh, specifically on the let's say the the activities on the surface of the sun, which are sunspots and sunstorms, uh, which sort of erupt sort of, um, magnetic, uh, electromagnetic uh, energy um, into space. Um, and he was trying to find out whether those eruptions had any influence on social life on Earth, especially in relation to wars, big historic events uh, such as wars, such as epidemic, uh, epidemics. Um, and um, he found, uh, again, Chichevsky himself was a hard scientist, let's say he was an engineer, so he had quite important contributions to the field of uh, air purification, for example. He built, uh, sort of, um, let's say, purification machines that cleaned the air in factories, so as such he, he was uh, a scientist who had uh, sort of very concrete 
results. Uh, but his um, more theoretical work was more speculative. Um, and um, generally it's thought that sort of the, the upper atmospheres around the Earth are uh, influenced by uh, uh, X-rays and uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, energy, but the lower um, atmospheres of the Earth are protected from that, and also especially we are, as humans living on the surface of the planet, are protected from that, otherwise we would not be able to exist in this way. Um, and Chichevsky was trying to find out if somehow the activities that would reach the upper uh, parts of the Earth would somehow still uh, influence social life. Um, <clears throat> he made a statistical study and he, within a statistical study he did find out, find relationships between um, the eruption of uh, sort of eruptions on the surface of the sun and um, and and wars, he would find um, looking at um, sort of large violent historic events from 5th century BC until the 1930s. Um, he could find and and sort of juxtaposing them to uh, moments where there was a lot of activity on the surface of the sun, he could find some connections there. Um, and there are many of these theories. I sort of I wasn't interested in this in this theory per se, but um, I found it curious, but I wasn't so much interested in, in the theory. I at some point uh, got in touch with uh, a German scientist who in the 1990s, uh, 1997, did a research on Chichevsky's statistical studies. It's a long story about numbers and, and about statistics, but um, it will go somewhere. Um, and um, uh, Sudbert Ettel from uh, the University of Göttingen, who in uh, seventy nine wrote, wrote a paper just studying the, the statistics of, of Chichevsky. And uh, Ettel found out that uh, purely as, as a statistical study, you could assume that there is a relationship between those two, let's say, um, uh, those two sort of uh, um, kind of chapters of uh, or columns of data, um, but what was interesting in, in the conclusion of Ertel, and this was written in the 90s, was that he said uh, as a conclusion that the next moment that uh, these numbers can be tested again would be 2001, which would be another uh, year uh, of uh, high eruptions on the sun and these moments of high erup like eruptions on the sun they work in cycles so it's easy to predict when the next sort of peak would come uh, and roughly it happens in, in um, sort of a cycle of, of about 11 years um, and um, it made me realize very simply that from the moment from where I was standing um, in 2005 that uh, there is such a there was such a moment. Obviously, I knew because I experienced it. But there was such a moment before 9/11, and there was a moment where um, you actually could not imagine 9/11. Um, and also that this moment in the 90s felt so innocent. <coughs> the 90s, um, for some reason, or not for some reason, for that exact reason, um, felt very very innocent from um, sort of. The, the point of view of, of where I was standing um, in 2005 in the middle of, let's say, uh, after the uh, Iraqi invasion and also in 2006, uh, the capturing and, um, and also the trial of uh, Saddam Hussein. Um, um, so in that moment it felt very, I don't know, innocent to read this report from before, let's say, this, this uh, huge event. Um, um, so the whole sort of work of Chichevsky for me creates, gives a framework to somehow, um, I don't know, yeah, frame um, uh, a world that I cannot really grasp and I sort of have difficulties to sort of grasp what, what is going on and, and where it is going to and I guess something that we are all uh, experiencing. Um, 
in 2006, uh, yeah, the, there was this um, video of, uh, of Saddam Hussein was captured uh, and then later trial, and there were two versions of the video. There was one version which was a press, uh, official press, press image, which was taken from, uh, from a distance, from a tripod, it was a static image, it was distant. And the video cut before uh, Saddam Hussein was actually hung, and so you, could, you didn't see the moment that he um, uh, died. Um, and a few days afterwards, uh, another um, video surfaced uh, and was circulated, which was filmed from within the group that was witnessing his uh, hanging. Uh, and it was not from a tripod, it was filmed with a cell phone, I believe. Uh, and it's sort of a sh sort of not static, sh kind of shaky. And it had a different perspective, different point of view. Uh, also there was sound, uh, the, I believe, but I'm not sure, the press video was, was, was mute. Um, but most importantly, it did not stop before the moment that Saddam Hussein was um, sort of hung, when you could actually uh, see the entire moment and you could see his body and how it reacted to uh, him uh, choking to death. And um, it was in a period where these kind of images were circulating through in, in, uh, in mainstream media, basically. There was no way to um, not see it. Um, it was um, sort of a part of mainstream visual culture. Um, and this became much more of a convention in the in the years afterwards with the decapitations of ISIS, um, which the decapitations themselves were never shown on mainstream media, but the the images were a part of this visual economy, um, and the, the the videos were definitely sort of shown, and and then at some point uh, sort of the video would stop um, before the decapitation really happened and. Um, Qaddafi's uh, capturing was also part of that, uh, let's say, circulation and economy of images. So um, I was really struggling with how to relate to this uh, economy of images and where my position was as a, as a visual artist. And also, um, I think it's an experience that we all have that, that the kind of, these kind of hyper-violent images are very numbing at some point. I mean, the, this, uh, the, Exposure and the overexposure uh, to these images that they kind of numb you, yet you become uh, insensitive to what you're looking at. And um, there are different mechanisms that, that cause that. Um, um, but I was also, yeah, since it was clear to me that this was really a visual culture which was so much a part of my generation, I felt that I had to somehow try to find a position um, in that. So. Um, Around the same time, also um, through a Freedom of Information Act, through a, a, a long um, lawsuit, um, a lot of uh, footage from the, which was previously classified uh, and, and so prohibited to be circulated, uh, classified footage from 9/11 was um, through a free, Freedom of Information Act was uh, given free, so it was unclassified, and it became a part of the public domain. There were terabytes of, of footage which uh, became a part of public domain and was accessible on, on the internet. And what was interesting about that footage was that it was raw and uncut footage, or camera footage, uh, made by press agencies and cameramen, but um, you would have uh, the entire footage, so you'd have hours and hours of of uh, camera footage, which was unedited, so unmediated. And so for me, it was um, very valuable footage to try to understand what in an image is news value and what in an image related to such uh, historic events can still be considered, I don't know, uh, sort of apart from being a news, still being open enough to have some sort of emotional reaction to um, what, what uh, we all know the, the collapse of the Twin Towers um, and we all know so there are a few images that are circulated again and again 
But around those images, um, there are moments where uh, the event was recorded where nothing happens. Um, and you just see a camera on, 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 the, on the sidewalk. Um, and it gives, another, it gives another type of value or it gives another type of entrance into, into this event, uh, a visual entrance into this event. And um, so for me, it was sort of valuable to, to go through this footage and to, to indeed find another entrance into this event, which, was, which is net less numbing, let's say, which has some sort of openness to have an emotional reaction to it. So that was one part of the, the research. Um, and um, um, I worked a lot with, uh, with this footage as found footage. Uh, I wanted to work with this found footage as being unmediated, so un unedited, basically uncut. Um, and especially uh, I wanted to find uh, sort of an emotional, I don't know, entrance into this this event that we all experienced. Um, and I found out that especially in the moments where there is nothing to see, when the, there is no representation, um, so here the, the sort of element of representation comes back, there's, when there is no representation, when the, 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 the image does not sort of produce a picture uh, that represents the, the, the event, um, it is exactly in those moments where there's no representation where you can um, sort of find another entrance <coughs> into, into this history. Um, so those moments are a big part of the film Cosmism. Um, they are, uh, the, the film starts with the Twin Towers, uh, one of the Twin Towers collapsing. And then um, everyone runs away, but the one who, who makes the image that you're looking at, uh, the cameraman stands still and does not run away. So everyone is passing him and he's standing still. And then a cloud basically covers the camera. Um, and then the image is black and the image remains black for about four minutes. Um, and this moment where the image is black, meaning that, that it's not representational, um, also kind of projects you um, into that moment and you are really there, and you experience real time. So four minutes is really four minutes. Um, and it's, it's a very, we all, I think we all have this experience, or we can all imagine this experience, that uh, when you have uh, something happens which is very emotional, then your experience of time is very warped. I mean, time can slow down, or time can go very fast, or maybe time cannot, can, does not exist, you just forget about the element of time. Um, and so, with the distance of this documentation, um, you are there for four minutes and you also have this time to, um, let's say, to um, um, sort of, to think about, or, yeah, to think about your emotional response uh, to this event, which is a part of our collective memory. Um, so, to this sounds all very technical, but this is sort of very much a part of how I try to, or, or what I try to do with the work, or what was the questions that I was trying to uh, asking myself is, um, how do you how do you open up such a large historical event, which is very violent, and um, uh, to uh, sort of. Uh, an open response, let's say, of the viewer. Um, and so especially these moments where you can experience real time and you experience almost like you experience time only because there's nothing to see. There is no image that can sort of fill in your emotions or there's no image that can, uh, or no, let's say, picture something that you can recognize that can fill in your emotions or no picture or something that you can recognize that can tell you how to feel uh, it is really only black, and all you have is your memory, and a collective memory, and a sort of a memory of a moment uh, that we all uh, sort of uh, have responded to and respond to. Um, all you have is that moment, so that moment is kind of like frozen in time. Um, and then in the film, 
the after four minutes the cameraman wipes away the the, the dust uh, um, of the lens and and you can see a bit more of where you are you are in New York and the twin towers have just collapsed and all you see is dust um, I decided also to cut the sound uh, because in this raw camera footage there is sound but I also decided to cut the sound to give uh, even less sort of impulse um, so all you have is your own position you sitting there looking at this image uh, that um, brings you back to a moment uh, that you all that that you all have uh, sort of uh, that that is a part of a collective um, experience in a collective memory, um, and this is purely a question. I, I it's too big of an ex too big of a, uh, let's say too big of a subject to solve. But definitely, by thinking about all of this and by looking asking myself this these questions. Um, obviously I was looking at sort of trying to find out if an image can trigger, still trigger empathy, which I think is a very, very relevant thought in the overproduction of images that uh, pretty much numbs us uh, on a daily basis. Is, is, is an image still capable of um, triggering uh, something uh, which can be called empathy? I don't know, and definitely I don't uh, suggest that this work does that, but at least it was one of the bigger questions that I was uh, asking um, myself. Um, um, yeah, so I think, I mean, one of the obvious things that um, uh, you, can, you can think of is that if you, if you speak about real time, uh, then uh, it is definitely not the kind of real time that I'm talking about which is kind of related to this conversation between fiction and documentary. Um, it's more about um, the sort of juxtaposition between figuration or representation and abstraction. Um, and especially this element of abstraction is I know, still, I think a relevant, uh, let's say, thing to speak about in the visual culture that we're in right now, especially uh, since we are so informed by um, images that have always have news value. Um, the the element of abstraction is then gets kind of a new, I don't know, layer or level. Um, um, so this was also I don't know why I kind of found it important to go back to 9-11. Um, um, let's see. Um, yeah, and then the rest of the film uh, also, not the entire, the film is 30 minutes and not the entire film is black. So you, you see different, uh, uh, you see different violent events which are all related to 9-11 and the subsequent, uh, no, um, mm, was the subsequent war in, in Iraq um, and uh, there are also images of the first first war uh, of, uh, of uh, Iraq uh, the first Gulf War of Iraq in the early 90s um, um, let's see what I yeah um, to uh, how, how are we doing for time how uh, it's okay. You're, you're still in your uh, yeah. 30 plus minutes, but you are in 30 plus now. Okay, 30 plus. Okay, <laughs> okay. Good, good. So, good to know. Uh, yeah, to, to, uh, um, to find a vocabulary for myself and to find a way to, an, an entry into these questions for myself, um, I, uh, while I was working on this film, I found myself uh, visiting uh, the Rijks Museum a lot, as, and especially, uh, or not a lot, but quite regularly, and especially mm -hmm. one painting uh, by a, a, from the 17th century by a Dutch painter called Jan de Baan, um, which is a small painting, uh, I think roughly about 60 centimeters or something in, in height, uh, Baroque painting, um, 
of uh, called um, um, in Dutch the verminkte lijken van uh, de gebroeders de Wit. So uh, summarize the, the sort of the lynched body of the brothers uh, de Wit. Um, Jan de Baan painted uh, uh, this painting around uh, the 1670s. I don't think an exact date is known. Um, and the painting depicts uh, two brothers who were lynched in the 19th century um, in an event which was an important historical sort of turning point in, in the history of, of the Netherlands and could, could be seen as one of the moments that decided that later on the Netherlands would become a monarchy. Um, and uh, the, 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 the two brothers were from uh, well, the lynching was a result of, of, of a clash between two, uh, two uh, families, two political families in the Netherlands. Um, and so um, the brothers were lynched um, and they were uh, hung there, they were, they were lynched by an angry mob. Um, again, you can read this much better than I can tell you on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, but uh, the painting shows the, uh, them uh, sort of you uh, hanging um, on a square and uh, they are gutted so their sort of organs are cut out and uh, the uh, and, and hung upside down basically so it really uh, looks like uh, they've been butchered and it's, it looks like you're looking at slabs of meat that are hanging from uh, from a butcher uh, store and Jan de Baan, it's a Baroque painting, uh, and uh, the, it's, it's the, the source of light is a single torch. Uh, and so it's quite theatrical, uh, how, the way it's lit and the way it's depicted. Um, but um, for me, it was an, an, a way to, at least to try to find a vocabulary, or, or sort of to try to find grip myself on um, sort of the, the, the question of the representation of violence and the mechanism that drive these, uh, these images to be made and to be seen, basically. But <coughs> a painting um, is, especially from the 19th, from the 17th century, is less provocative than the gore that you can find on the internet. Um, and also with the distance of history, you often have uh, more sort of distance yourself uh, to to think about things. So f for me, often these kind of these these paintings are a way to find my thoughts in to navigate within the questions that I'm asking myself. Um, and um, um, what's interesting in in this painting is uh, that although it's a Baroque painting and there's a sense of theatricality, it's still quite subdued and uh, it shows the, these brothers hanging and lynched uh, uh, the night after uh, they were um, uh, they were they were murdered basically so there is no history uh, hysteria around it the hysteria of the lynching is is gone they are kind of it's a quiet painting they are uh, isolated on a square um, and it's quite quite in a way sort of subdued um, a relative uh, sort of sober, so which kind of fits with this um, more Protestant ver yeah, version of, of, of Baroque uh, painting. Um, but what's interesting about it is also that um, um, because the hysteria uh, is, is gone, uh, the hysteria of an angry mob is gone. There are other pain, there are other images of the, the this lynching of the brothers to it, which can also be found on the internet, that uh, are a lot more violent and a lot more sort of have a lot more focus on the news value and and also you can see the hysteria around the mob in, in other paintings that or images that were made uh, of this event. But this particular painting is sort of devoid of that, um, and it offers you time to think about. Um, um, what you're looking at, and it sort of it offers you time to grow into the image, to to um, to also understand the mechanisms which have to do with uh, an appeal to look at such images, and uh, and a necess necessity, uh, if only 
uh, <coughs> because of its news value to produce those images. Um, and um, it gives you also sort of time to be aware of the kind of perversity uh, that is inherent uh, to looking at these representations of violence. Um, although it's from the 19th century, there is still some perversity there in being curious uh, of, uh, of, of such images. So it's, it's not only a representation of violence, but it's also kind of, it's a representation of death, uh, and also through the genre of horror almost. Um, and um, sort of the, the intimacy that you can, uh, that sort of, the intimacy that the painting offers also is an in intimacy that can uh, offers you, uh, you know, time and space to think about your own position in relation to what you're looking at. Um, so, um, oh, and it is not, uh, I mean, on one hand you can say, well, it's just a painting, who cares? But on the other hand, it's, uh, it, it is quite a profound thing that they are still hanging in public, basically. Uh, these brothers who were lynched in the 1970s, they, they were put to justice in a very, uh, uh, Sort of in a very random way, um, and um, but basically they are still uh, hanging in public, and basically the public humiliation extends, and basically also you as a viewer are somehow implicit through that public uh, humiliation. So, so these kind of mechanisms you can uh, I don't know um, you can examine while you're looking at the painting and. Um, Especially, this is very much a part of, of the mechanism, which I think um, is a part of a lot of images that represent violence. Is uh, that it's partly as a as a viewer, you are uh, uh, complicit, mm, not necessarily to the act of killing, obviously, but complicit to um, um, uh, the representation of violence or um, because there is a viewer these things are made um, and um, um, especially with this representation of violence there is this mechanism that always has to do with sort of you as a viewer on one hand closing one eye because uh, of repulsion and uh, sort of not um, wanting to look at it but also opening one eye because of curiosity uh, and because of the need to know things um, and thus sort of with this split mind consuming um, these images. So, um, um, so although this is uh, an old image and an old painting, uh, the mechanisms uh, are still there and um, because you don't have um, an emotional um, um, relationship to this event it happened a long time ago no one remembers it um, you can actually um, sit there and face the mechanisms and, and try to understand um, sort of what is happening while you're looking at it um, um, which I think in a way, I tried to transfer these questions in the way I um, worked with the, the, uh, the film Cosmism uh, and using, um, let's say, another event to 9-11 um, to at least trigger the audience to think about similar uh, questions. And again, I have to do it, this in a way, I have conclusions. They are just questions that I started with the work with and I tried to transfer to the viewer. For me, a work, and especially film, is always, um, it's always up to the viewer. I mean, I, I will never tell a viewer what the film is about or what you should do. It's always sort of up to the viewer. Um, um, so I, I think also <coughs> after this long talk about images and what images can do and not do, it, it makes sense not to show images, in fact, um, and
and to talk about the representation of images because once you show an image, it basically fills up the room, but it also fills up your mind. Um, and uh, sometimes it's easier to speak about images without images being there. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin, for this uh, long mediation on uh, images. Yeah, um, yeah, it's um, uh, it's of course it's, it brings together several very diverse things. Uh, you start with the um, discovery of a group of scientists who <coughs> found some remarkable correspondence between uh, solar activity or activity of the sun and activities on Earth, uh, whereby uh, there seems to even to be uh, a kind of a correlation between the activities of the Sun and 9-11 in the sense that in 2001 there was this enormous activity uh, of solar activity at the day of 9-11. Uh, but then at the same time most of your, yeah, your investigation is about the absence of images or the, um, let's say, the, what happens in images that represent these intense moments of violence, historical significance. But it's at the same time, we have a very peculiar relationship to those images, um, like from 9-11, the, from but also from before. And then you also connect it to this, uh, this painting that you were interested in in the, in the Rijksmuseum um, that shows the lynching of the brothers uh, De Witt. And so it's, it goes from old representation of violence to contemporary mass media, mediatized representation of violence, and kind of scientists that think about violence and light and the sun, uh, which is also very, kind of, if you think about cinema, a very meaningful correlation. And so all these things come together in this work. And I thought maybe um, I was. Um, thinking maybe a way into a conversation also about this would be to focus also on this, this start of the film, which is um, um, represent first uh, is, is a shot of a decapitation, a uh, very old uh, trick film, which shows kind of the, the, the endless obsession of people to make film about violence. But then it goes to the first uh, Iraq war. And um, I was thinking, Looking also at your at your age, yeah. I will not say it in public, but I looked at it because we're not that far apart. <laughs> and I and I thought um, that um, how do you remember that moment? Because this was really pre, let's say, uh, internet images and and all that kind of thing. And I remember watching it on very grainy grainy television, color television. Do you remember those images from yeah. that first Iraq war? Where where were you when you were, when that happened? Uh, well, in, in the time of my life, I was in high school, early mm -hmm. high school. And in uh, which one? Uh, which city? In Rotterdam. In Rotterdam. Uh, and uh, I was watching it uh, at a friend's house. Yeah. But all I remember was uh, green lights, and those were bombings. Yeah. So it was entirely, completely abstract. It was there was a black image, and green lights being shot into the air, and um, and that was a bombing on, on the other side of the world. Yeah. Um, but um, and what was the what was the emotion in the house when this was happening? Uh, like, were people upset or were they afraid? Were you afraid? No. Do you no, I do, I I do remember it was far away, mm -hmm. uh, and everything about it was distant. But it was, uh, for me, definitely the first uh, large war yeah. that I um, that I we, looked at with his life. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was very, very clear that it was big news, and it was also very clear that it was bad news. Uh, but also it was very clear that it was very far away. Mm -hmm. um, and um, looking at it now, I can also see that in all the images that, or well, not all the images, but a lot of the, the sort of the, let's say, the, the way the, the war was um, covered, um, to me, still now have, has a lot to do with, uh, with, with distance. Um, 
and also the the uh, footage that I'm using in the film was all filmed from the side of the city or like the, the let's say the border of the city mm -hmm. because journalists were not allowed to to go into the city they didn't have permission to go into, into the city so mm -hmm. you see the bombing of Iraq uh, from from <coughs> from far away and cameras were lined on the border of the city um, and the distance also uh, relates to the control of images I mean, who controls uh, these images because the representation of, of the war is a part of warfare mm. um, so uh, the fact that uh, when did you become aware of that that the representation of war is part of warfare uh, uh, actually with uh, Colin Powell when the when they yeah. saw showed those uh, yeah. images of uh, yeah. the non-existent mass, there was a complete uh, fiction. Mass, so yeah. yeah, there was a moment where I uh, where it was clear to me to um, uh, yeah, it's just sort of a moment where where the ground sort of disappears under your feet because you you cannot trust uh, what you see anymore mm -hmm. um, and. It was also very clear that uh, a fiction was fabricated uh, by the manipulation of images uh, to basically go go to war. Yeah. Um, and did you, because in the 90s there was this whole discussion, if you both the are started about this idea that the Cold War never, never happened, and that it was all, uh, let's say, fiction, that it was all televised. Um, but did, did that ever, let's say, on the one hand, it's manipulated, at the same time, do you, did you ever doubt the truth of those images? No, it's too abstract. <laughs> it was too abstract for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, but, but also the, 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 the idea that it never happened yeah, yeah. and it was entirely fabricated. Or, uh, uh, it, was, uh, too, yeah, it was too abstract for me. But, um, and I also never, uh, with, even, even though the, the, the bombings were, completely abstract. Um, I never doubted, perhaps I should have, but I never doubted the reality, reality of them. Yeah. yeah, no. Um, but it also, uh, I think, uh, with, with this memory, I also look at um, news coverage differently now. For example, um, uh, a lot of the uh, the Arabic Spring mm -hmm. uh, was covered with cell phones, uh, so, so CN, CNN covered with cell phones because uh, reporters can, don't need a crew uh, and they can be uh, in the middle of a square uh, and kind of doing, and, and live life, uh, coverage was, was very, sort of, ha had become very conventional. Mm -hmm. So it is completely the opposite uh, of, the, of, of covering a war when journalists are forced to be on the border of a city uh, to basically control not to control the image of a war but also to uh, be able to do a lot of damage without there being a, a human, humanitarian uh, sort of um, let's say questioning about mm. what's happening um, that's completely the opposite of how in the last five years um, sort of large, large events are being covered yeah. from within uh, the group uh, where um, the journalists and the reporters are subjected to the same anxiety as, um, as, as the people that are, um, let's say, yeah, on, on, on the more active side of the event. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, for me, a lot, I mean, I remember only a few let's say, f fragments of the war, uh, but it d did. It was definitely a part of being aware of what an image is and, uh, uh, yeah. Because it seems also that that is almost like a, um, let's say, um, a thematic in the, in the film in the sense that you're either too far away or you're too close eh, yeah. to the event in, in how the images are, are, are shot. Um, it, it's uh, it, it only at few moments do you actually that th these things come together, yeah, um, and only at the beginning actually. Yeah, so then the it's kind of you drive in, um, and you seem to be much more interested in this film at least in images that are 
in a way too close or too far away. Um, and let's say what, and you say, well, when you describe that moment, eh, so uh, one segment in the film, you, you are in a, in, a, in a dust cloud that is produced by the collapse of the World Trade Center. And yeah, if you, yeah, you know that you are in that dust cloud, but you, yeah, you only see yeah, like an abstract painting almost of, 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 of pixels moving on the screen. And uh, you, you describe, well, maybe if you watch that, you, you get a moment of empathy in the sense that you might be able to think through what it means not just to grasp what the meaning of the event or let's say the, uh, let's say the meaning of the event in almost let's say direct fact like something is collapsing and then you understand that something is collapsing not that you understand what are the let's say the effects of that collapse but then suddenly you maybe yeah, understand something else of that collapse by being <coughs> in, in that dust cloud. And yeah, what, what, and that you call somehow related to empathy. Well, what, yeah, what so, em yeah. I mean, empathy is a, is a big, let's say, uh, ambition. Yeah. But but uh, I think it's it's an entrance at least to relate to what had been felt at that moment. And um, I also from nine eleven, what I remember a lot are uh, um, the phone calls that were broadcasted mm -hmm. um, during, uh, during in, in the weeks of 9-11 and there were people who called 9-11, uh, 9-11 uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, from within the buildings and none of these, these the phone calls have no image, they, they have no image so, so you hear someone's voice and you see subtitles mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think because there is no image, you uh, and of, obviously because of the highly emotional sort of uh, yeah uh, content of the phone call, uh, you understand what is happening. You have a one-to-one -one connection to the person who is emotional, mm. um, and there is nothing that can take the place of that. I mean, there's no image that can kind of take the place of that, or there's no image that can kind of sit in between that um, and um, there, is this, there is a moment in the film Cosmism where there was also no, there was also, you, you see black, uh, but there is sound mm -hmm. um, and for me that has a similar, uh, let's say, it works in a similar way as those phone calls because you, can, you only hear people shouting and you only hear people uh, being anxious, but that's uh, actually all you need to know and that's actually um, all the information uh, that's that's all the information that, that, that that's enough mm -hmm. um, so and then let's say you, you um, th this is your experience of that material right? like uh, this is how you've experienced that material and maybe also at the moment experienced that footage that came out or du during the event <coughs> Let's say you make, and then you make the film uh, out of it, um, which let's say highlights that, uh, puts emphasis on it in a different way, connects it to other uh, images and other kind of uh, sequences. What do you see? Your because you you say I'm I'm not providing an answer with these images, but certainly they do uh, respond to an interest that you have to see them in this way. This is how you, yeah, well, so something happens when you put them together like this, which for you, in some ways, then meaningful uh, in, in how it offers you a new perspective on, these, on this material. How do you look at that material then? What do you see in it? If you see it reconfigured in your film, what are you looking for when you make this film? Um, yeah, that's... That, that's a different question. I think um, when I make a film, I, I try to see it as a container of mm. different, several ideas, um, and I loosely put several ideas together. Mm. Um, and that's always how I see film and how, how I make a film. Um, and is it then you put it together and you try out many different things and suddenly you feel like this is it? Or does it come together? In it, uh, how, do, how does the creative process it comes, go? It comes together yeah. quite slowly yeah. and uh, comes together very tentatively and, uh, and 
and with this film also, uh, it also comes together with a lot of friction. Uh, so it is never a moment where I think, well, this is it, because it is actually, I mean, it has a lot of friction in it. And, mm -hmm. um, so that's also fine uh, for me. But I think, in general, I think um, one of, for me, to put it very simply, is that um, it is very clear that we are living in a world and both, um, let's say, uh, the political climate um, shows that, but also uh, the climate crisis shows that, that we are living in a world where things are interconnected. Um, and I think that is pretty much, let's say, the the atmosphere of the of, of the current climate that we are mm -hmm. that things are interconnected and I think uh, that uh, thought uh, holds things together in this in this film uh, simply to say it simply that that things are interconnected and it's something that no one seems to have a, a grip on mm -hmm. um, yeah. because. Hello. A lot of the film, in a way, is abstract. Huh? It's almost abstract, <coughs> it's figurative, but then almost meaningless in what you see. And like you could, you could see, you could read that abstraction in different way. Maybe so you could think about this kind of, ex yeah, this 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 use of these kind of images in different way. Like you could say it's a critical interrogation of, let's say, mass media images, but. This doesn't seem like a critical interrogation of, of images in that way. It more, much more seems like an experience of these images that are part of that world, but then that are, uh, let's say, the, these are the images that we normally miss. Yeah. And then suddenly you put all the energy on these, all the focus on these images that normally we, we would miss. And it, you, you, you don't see, yeah, look at, and I, I, I was wa watching the film again today, and I, I was wondering, like, um, well, how, how would you look at it in the sense, are you, yeah, maybe it's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get too much in your head with this, but uh, I was just curious, thinking, like, do you think a lot, or are you very emotional when you see those images, or are you, yeah, or are you going through all kinds of thoughts when you, when you, Look at this material. No, when I was uh, now, I've seen the film so many times that it's for me hard to be. <laughs> yeah, emotional. yeah, okay, of course, yeah. <laughs> but but there was one but today. There was, <laughs> no, I mean looking, yeah. going through this archive of of, uh, mm. of this public archive of nine eleven, it uh, um, it is so important that that this is a part of the public domain, and it you now was absolutely felt very. Uh, yeah, very, very emotional. Uh, looking back at, at some of the images, but it's not just. I think it's not just abstraction because abstraction um, can come from, uh, let's say, the, com can come from different uh, motivations. But it's especially abstraction in relation to collective memory, um, when then uh, an image gets a different function. I mean, you automatically. Uh, fill in the, the the absence of an image with uh, the, with with the collective memory that we have. Uh, so it's a very I mean this is a part of the let's say this in a way our the collective your collective our collective memory is a part of the image, um, which is a different way of using uh, abstraction because um, it can also be a way to indeed be more critical of representation or be more isolating, uh, also sort of to, 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 let's say, isolate something. Um, but this is specifically abstraction in relation to, um, to, to something which I know there is a, there is a collective uh, um, memory. Mm -hmm. And then the final movie, I'm also looking, sometimes you don't maybe notice it, but I'm also looking a little bit at you if you already are wanting to ask a question, because then we can also include that in the conversation. But maybe I now just announce that I'm curious to hear your Keep thoughts, it, yeah. and then uh, I will ask one more question while you think of a question to, to do that. 
because there is one uh, type of image in that uh, in the film that is also very specific and, and distinct, which is these uh, uh, close-up images of the sun and next to some. Yeah, maybe we should also talk about your own homemade sci-fi uh, moments in the film. But uh, the sun is certainly a very important image in this film, and. Um, from the story, the research that you did, it's a very comprehensive image because it's the sun and it's the relationship between the sun and the activities. But in the film itself, you don't explain that relationship. It's more like one image next to the other. Um, I was, um, on the one hand, curious, like if for you, the, if this again was a moment of abstraction, or if this was then a moment of, let's say, super literalness, like you really see the sun in a detail that you've never seen before. And how for you the sequence in that sense work between the abstraction of the film and the, and the, then the, let's say the, the, the figurative quality of the sun, but at the same time the combination is quite abstract again, because yeah you don't know necessarily the fact that these scientists manage to find a correlation between the no two. no well um, so on that level it's important to also uh, say that the the images, of the images of the sun are all also from, from public domain and from NASA. Mm. And NASA has uh, made photographs of the sun for decades. Uh, but since recently, um, they have been, uh, the sun has been photographed in high definition. Um, so only since, I'm not sure, I, I mean, cannot make this claim in public, but let's say 15 years or something, there are comprehensive images of the sun. So only since recently, um, the sun can be viewed from different parts, and the sun can be viewed from close up, and the sun can be viewed from with, in high definition. So only recently, actually, the sun has become a part of has become an image, basically. Um, and it is exactly this um, the fact that you're looking at an image of the sun, which is uh, completely absurd, uh, because uh, it, uh, I mean, you can make an image smaller and bigger. I mean, it, and um, you can uh, you can sort of expand and shrink the sun. Mm -hmm. These are all pretty much absurd things because it's um, it's um, it's a large star. Um, so you again, you're looking at your. It is literal, but at the same time, it's entirely absurd too because it's it's a, yeah. it's it's, a, it's an abstraction in itself. Um, but also it creates, um, um, it creates a distance um, and it also imposes the question that I think is very relevant in any climate discussions is that are we subjected by nature or are we able to subject nature and um, the, all, all of these sort of high definition images of, of uh, that um, are a part of that question, basically. It's like, what is the, yeah, what is the role of, of human beings in relation to nature? Mm -hmm. that, um, so, Be because in a, in a sense, your film almost asks another question: like, are we subjected to nature or are we subjected to technology? Yeah, because it, the film technology, like, it, sometimes you wonder, like, let's say, would would nine eleven have happened if it couldn't be filmed? Right. Huh? Yeah. Because well, well, let's say, who, how, how would it have worked yeah. without that? That element. Yeah. Do you see technology as part of nature, or do you see it as part of man? It's, it's part of man. Yeah. 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 It's it's com completely an invention that serves only us. Yeah. Yeah. And do we control it, or does it control? No way. Yeah. <laughs> no. But also, uh, yeah. I think also uh, in any conversation about artificial intelligence, you can see that. Uh, it uh, w that uh, that we can also also not even control the questions around technology, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, sort of questions around um, um, sort of ethical questions around medical science. Um, we are sort of constantly um, inventing things and then uh, and, and have have no idea what will you know. So, so no, we, we don't control that, no. no it's, all, it's, it's all, I saw your hand, but no. Oh, yeah. It was the corner of my eye, but it creates an image, you could say. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Anyone? Yeah.
much yet. Okay. No, oh, then I have to check the time because I'm, uh, yeah. Um, no, I, um, 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 let's say, because, uh, let's say, this rings maybe to a very complex uh, issue, but, well, it's kind of a central issue in your, in your whole film and research which is not so much uh, addressed maybe directly, but, uh, but all the time indirectly, and that, let's say, what is human agency in this? I mean, well, let's say, who is, who is uh, deciding something in this, uh, in this constellation of relationships that, I mean, everything is connected, and yeah, in the end it comes down to you sitting in your room or studio and then combining these things for this film. But in a way, it's a reflection also on all these people that sit in, in, in rooms looking at screens and, and are connected. And yeah, do, do, they, what they, do, do they decide to intervene or are they manipulated <laughs> into responding? <laughs> What's your, let's say, is there a human agency in your role? Uh, yeah, yes, of course. I mean, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's also, um, I don't know, for me, the kind of contract that, you, uh, that, you, that I assume uh, we have mm -hmm. <laughs> is that um, people are voluntarily being manipulated um, for different reasons in order to uh, sort of, to, uh, to for in, in film, for sure, well, forget where you are, or to you know, to, to, uh, or to remind you where you are. But I think it's a, I wouldn't call it a game, but it's more of a contract of <coughs> being voluntarily manipulated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, in a way, we do it to ourselves. In yeah. A sense. I, think, I, I mean, that's at least uh, how I go to see things. Good. Yeah, I think um, I'm still looking. <laughs> You're not sitting in my eyes, so you have to be specific. But um, um, let's say we do it to ourselves. We, um, in a way, open ourselves up to this kind of image manipulation. Maybe even since time immemorial, I mean, at least to the 17th century, we are let's say, fascinated by uh, violence, uh, to, to, to watch violence, to experience violence. Um, and then, yeah, you could, let's say, there is another, maybe another possible uh, reading to the, to the uh, empathy that you, uh, or let, maybe, yeah, to this idea of empathy that you, that you pose. Um, <coughs> because, you could say empathy is a is a way to uh, to try to experience what somebody else has experienced, which is uh, always in a way an impossibility because we are different people. At the same time, we are not completely like one of the unique things about human beings is that they can imagine things, uh, which are yeah, which can also make them let's say relate to things that they didn't really experience, but what they did is saw and then start to, to speculate about. It's a, let's say this empathy is a great force. We can try to be somebody else. Uh, but maybe it's also a dark sort of inspiration <coughs> because we might also be able to start to think about the horrible and start to be interested in horror and, and violence and images of violence. Uh, which maybe are not violent in themselves but there's always a question like which comes first, the image or the violence then. Uh, and then you make a film about a very violent event, um, which in a way is abstract of that violence, like they um, never really goes to that moment of violence. It never shows Saddam, uh, let's say, uh, struggling for his life and then dying. Um, but you focus on four minutes of darkness, blackness, maybe darkness is not the right word, blackness, like absence. You, could you also think about this kind of trying to confront people with images that they normally would look away from and, and invite them to kind of embrace them and to go through them, that 
that this might be also some sort of a way to, let's say, build another relationship to the image again. That this is another way, like a, almost like an antidote yeah. to our obsession with violence. Yeah. Like a medicine. Yeah, well, uh, it was, it's a very complicated question. I mean, I did think about that, of course. I wouldn't be able to pull it off. I think you have to be a different person mm -hmm. to pull it off. But what I did notice is that there is, um, there is an economy around images. And with an econ economy, I mean that there is a, there is a, uh, there is a kind of, uh, uh, there is something which is related to a transaction mm -hmm. uh, and related to some sort of demand uh, around around uh, so these images, violent images, and why violent images are made and how and why they are distributed. And, um, that it is also a part of. Um, political propaganda to show uh, the humiliation of, uh, of your opponents. Um, and I found it very complicated to, to uh, avoid this economy of, of uh, um, and so yeah, I found it, that question very complicated um, to, to actually show the gruesome images because they are Inherently part of an economy, which, um, the, which kind of uh, sort of capitalizes on humiliate on the, on the humiliation mm -hmm. uh, of, a, um, of of a human body, um, and yeah, I I'm not capable of uh, <laughs> of <laughs> of solving such difficult. I mean, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to. to, to I, I couldn't find my, uh, I, I couldn't find a way to solve that. Yeah. Um, no, I was more asking because, like in a way, you take a decision because you're not showing it. Right? You're yeah. not. It's not. But I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen and uh, and that and uh, so I've, I, and I've seen. I mean, not. But yeah, it's a part of the re re research. Yeah. Research, but also as, just simply as a part of. A visual culture which is a part of our generation mm. that that we know is just it's uh, sort of a, a, a part of things that uh, that kind of uh, that that we experience that we know ha ha happened. I mean, it's also a way for me as a as an artist to try to relate to that, um, and um, uh, and quite often uh, the the images are actually made. To show humiliation, in order to distribute that, in order to uh, to uh, kind of uh, dehumanize, basically yeah. uh, dehumanize your opponent, in order to uh, to uh, justify uh, sort of an, an agenda to you know to to kill people. So that is the economy of some of some of the image production of why it is it is made, um, and it is. For me, I found it way too complicated to, uh, as you kind of, in a, in a very idealistic way, to, to try to find an, another entry into those images or another um, sort of, another way of looking at that. Yeah. Um, like, I don't mean that you can resolve it. Eh? No. I mean, that's not something that I imagine that an artwork will do, but uh, I try to kind of position your artwork in, in this economy of images, which we, it exists within our world, and this is part of our world, so yeah, we cannot escape it. Um, at the same time, it takes a position against that uh, economy, against that, let's say, that circulation of images of violence that are made to justify violence and then also produce violence again. And then in that, uh, like, it. And then in that uh, economy, you place that the film, and maybe it's my my interpretation, like my uh, my response to the film in that sense, that when you sit there and you watch the kind of non-image that you uh, foreground, um, 
that it, it's an immensely rare um, uh, kind of experience of images in today's world because in all the other moments when we encounter these images, so on our on our phones and on our screens, we uh, we we always run away. Let's say run towards the moment of action. But if it becomes boring, we we tune off, we switch off. And then here, within the space of let's say an artwork, in the space of the gallery, in the space of a museum, um, you invite people to almost meditate on this non-image for for 28 minute minutes. And I thought maybe that has some sort of, um, let's say, it, 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 it helps you to, um, let's say, to uh, allow those non-images also to exist in your everyday life a little bit. Yeah. So it's not about solving it, but more about like, how does this work then uh, plays in that, or, or what, what, uh, what is the uh, aspiration of it? Yeah, I think it's the most important thing is that to simply um, spend time with it is a very rare thing. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's also a very, for me, a beautiful contract that you have with uh, any viewer is that you have at least, uh, you, ha you have an agreement that you, can, that you will spend time together. Um, and uh, so, so just simply to to spend time, um, it already opens up, uh, yeah, a, a, a sort of uh, like a completely different entry uh, to to the images that we're all sort of familiar mm -hmm. uh, familiar uh, with. And but also I think there are artists, of course, who do work with sort of uh, kind of. Uh, being working with pro provocative images, but also putting them within the speed of, mm. of consuming images and looking at images and uh, and the distribution of images. I mean, that happens. I think that's that's very relevant. But for me, it's also relevant to to exactly the opposite. I mean, I think there are just two different ways to try to come to grips with uh, uh, image production in general. Is that in one hand of course it's very relevant to go with the flow because it's a way to understand uh, that, I mean, the, the, the things that, that are being produced and how do, you, how do you consume them. But at the same time I also find it very important to go, uh, to, to resist um, and to do sort of the, the opposite. I think they're both relevant and they both point at the same thing, namely uh, image production and, mm -hmm. um, and what why is it relevant to produce an image in general and why is it relevant to show uh, an image uh, in general? I think, but definitely with my work, I, I try to resist um, and sort of have the opposite strategy. Yeah. And resistance. Just to quickly check time again, but not very secretly. I think we have a question, time for one more question before we, uh, we close. And um, I'm looking, I'm still looking, looking, looking. But, um, um, I think maybe the, the last question that, that I had in, in thinking about what you just said is, uh, like, what role does beauty play in all this? Yeah, well, seduction is a big, big part of, uh, of, uh, of well, images, yeah. of images, but also uh, I think uh, these kinds of questions are a little easier, at least for me it was easier to ask this question in front of a bottle of painting <laughs> yeah. than in front of um, um, sort of a more yeah. 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 yeah I mean but it's the same I mean it is uh, the same question and but sort of uh, beauty is I mean the uh, uh, aestheticizing um, violence um, is a big part of the perversity of uh, why you want to look at it. But do you think um, your film is beautiful? Um, it has, it play, it, it's seductive, yeah. It definitely uses seduction. Um, um, and, yeah, I mean, it's... it's but the, 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 the four minutes of, the, of black, of not... Of not it's not black. beautiful now. No? <laughs> I don't it think so. Also be yeah, beautiful. it could be, yeah, yeah. It's no. a, like, maybe, let's like, say,
Because does beauty exist in your world or is everything seduction? No, there is visual pleasure. I mean, but visual it is, pleasure. yeah, there's absolutely, I, I mean, beauty, I think, is visual pleasure and absolutely, uh, yeah, exists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are, and, uh, yeah, and it's absolutely a, a, a part of um, uh, a mechanism, but it's also a way to make people look at something. Yeah. Uh, it's also a way to make people sit uh, in the chair for 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I'm, but I'm absolutely aware uh, of that, and uh, it's definitely a part of yeah, a part of how to a, a part of storytelling in the end. I mean, mm -hmm. there is beauty and there is visual, there is seduction, but there is also storytelling. Simply, uh, it's also very much a part. Of, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think. We're gonna keep it at that. Um, so thank you all. Uh, thank you. Well, thank everybody for watching. Thanks to people here for joining us. And uh, thank you very much, Melvin, for Thanks. this uh, yeah. long yeah. reflection on your work. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's really nice to hear you meander around your uh, your 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 um, uh, your work and your thought process. Um, and it's. Um, like there is something that um, in in the in the whole discussion, but also in the film, let's say it's a kind of a celebration of indirectness. Yeah. Like you, we approach one of the most let's say significant events that we have experienced it, and we are looking at it from all kinds of all yeah. kind of the side, trying to find and learn something else from it, and maybe learn maybe much more about ourselves and how we relate to images than maybe about the event itself. But perhaps by learning let's say, what, what we do, what images do to us and how we do, uh, what we then do with images. Um, maybe the end is what this event for partially is about. So, thank you very much. Thank and, you. And, um, yeah, uh, I would say, it, I never did this. I would cannot say until uh, next time, because we're not going <laughs> to broadcast again. Thank you also uh, for all the technical team, Ron and Peter. Yeah. Um, and uh, next time. Um, which will not be next time, so goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>